welcome everybody to the second event in, in the fall speaker series here in SPA's Political Theory Institute. My name is Morgan Flanagan. Uh, I have a few announcements to make before we get to tonight's speaker. Uh, and, but before I say anything else, uh, many of you will have questions to submit. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function underneath. And when you do, please identify yourself. Um, we've got a lot of terrific students and former students and friends and uh, new friends. And so we'd like to hear, uh, we want to hear from you and we want to hear who you are. So please post your questions in the Q&A session. Okay, the fall lineup from here on out after tonight, on October 25th, we have Francis Fukuyama from Stanford University, uh, who's coming to speak on populism, polarization, and national identity. And that will be in conversation with uh, my colleague, Alan Devine. Uh, and then on November 11th, we've got Annika Prowler, uh, who's the founder of the Living Water School. She's gonna be speaking on the black classical tradition uh, this is our Lincoln Scholars Lecture this fall, and that will be in conversation with uh, Tom Merrill. The, uh, the last speaker of the fall series is December 2nd, and that's going to be Benjamin and Jenna Story of Thurman University. They're going to be speaking on why we are restless, the modern quest for contentment. And that will be in conversation also with Alan Vine. So we've got a lot of great things in store for you this fall. And I'm especially pleased uh, with tonight's guest because we have uh, Professor Sophie Marcouch Chenard, uh, who's gonna be speaking on Strauss and Arone on Thucydides. And as uh, some of you may know, I'm a big Thucydides fanatic. And so it's just uh, uh, Professor Marco Chenard, it's, it's very comforting to find another Thucydidean. So I really appreciate that you're here to speak with us tonight. So, um, so let's, let's begin. I, I really enjoyed this article. Um, uh, I've been made fun of. A colleague of mine said, oh, political theorists, they write books about books. And uh, uh, to which my response is, yeah, and you write books about charts, but I'm very happy to, to write about books and to read writing about books. And, and now you're gonna be speaking about writing about more writing. Uh, uh, Leo Strauss and, and uh, Raymond Aron writing about Thucydides. And the topic is, what can we learn from political history? So uh, I guess to start off, I, I'd like to ask, um, what is political history and uh, you know, how is it different from history? And what's, what's the, the fundamental issue that uh, Strauss and everyone are addressing? Um, thanks. Uh, and thank you, Borgen. Uh, Borden. I'm really happy to be discussing Thucydides with a specialist. Um, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts also on uh, these uh, questions. Uh, maybe I just want to start off perhaps with a precision because the title is what can we learn from political history? And there's the perhaps prior question, can we actually learn from political history? Um, I suppose that Leo Strauss and Ramon Aron kind of answer in the affirmative, but I, but I still want to um, highlight that it's an ongoing debate, um, whether there's something to be learned from history and what type of knowledge did it, this is. Is that a practical, theoretical knowledge? And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Hegel, but he famously said in his lectures on the philosophy of history that history and experience teach us that generally people have not learned from history. Uh, so there's this idea perhaps that um, it might be the case that our current political situation is so different from, for example, Thucydides' uh, situation in Athens that um, any attempt to find any type of knowledge from uh, Thucydides is, is doomed to fail. But there's also this kind of historiographical objection which is that um, if we are trying to transpose from the past elements that um, uh, do not belong in the present, we might be led to erroneous, unsophisticated, naive, or even easy comparison that um, 
are detrimental to both history and perhaps to the present as well. But despite this limit, these limitations, what I find interesting is that we nonetheless go back to history quite a lot. We see that in newspapers, right? For example, right now with the um, are we reliving the Weimar period? Uh, is Hitler's world not too far away? So people in maybe for rhetorical reasons or performative reasons still go back to history quite a lot. And um, I guess this raises a, a broader question about something that for the cities was central, which is that he was not writing a performance piece for the moment, but he was writing a possession for all times. And there's this belief until quite recently in history that um, History can be a teacher of life. It's the Ciceronian trope of Historia Magistra Vitae, that there's some type of reservoir of examples that might lead to um, history being a school of prudence or uh, being able to instruct us. So um, what is political history? What well, does part of the answer lies in um, this normative intent that the Thucydides is explicitly putting forward, which is to instruct posterity. But of course, um, maybe just to answer the question directly, um, we're talking about a time without any type of disciplinary distinctions that we understand now, them now. So it, of course, political history emerges in ancient Greece. Um, it is tied to Herodotus, to Thucydides, and um, it is different from history in the way we understand it in the sense that um, first it is understood in contrast with uh, Homeric narratives and myths. Um, Thucydides wants to recall what happened, uh, historian is translated by inquiry. He wants to inquire about what happened and what he witnessed during his time. Um, but also political history is defined by the fact that unlike modern cultural or social history, what is deemed important or worthy of mention are the actions and speeches of great individuals. So there's this element of focusing on human action and human speech specifically. Thucydides is not interested in um, uh, the everyday life. He's interested in the extraordinary. Therefore, he's looking at a war. And that's why they were writing mostly about wars because there was these kind of revelatory moments that encapsulate a lot about political action. And so the subject matter of history are these interruptions, the extraordinary. And perhaps one last element about political history is the reason why they're um, writing about it for Thucydides is writing about the war. Um, Anna Arendt has this great um, way of putting it. And it is, um, if I recall correctly, it is to save human deeds from the futility that comes from oblivion. That basically you wanna lend immortality to such uh, conducts or such virtues or vice or great or noble um, actions. So there's a question of greatness into it. And um, Aro and Strauss are both interested in human action in the political, in that aspect that for both of them is absolutely central to understanding the modern world, which is um, the actions of human beings, the motivations to act politically, the question of judgment. And so in that regard, I suppose they want to go back to classical political history because they find in Thucydides the ideal type of uh, such a writer. Yeah, it's very interesting because Thucydides, on the one hand, he says that he's writing uh, his history because it will expose the recurrent in, and then he uses this substantive, tonanthropinon, the, the human. Um, so something about and he doesn't say human nature, he says the human. So something about the human situation will recur. But then he's quite clear that people tend to warp history in a way that suits them. So he says, yeah, everybody thinks their war is the biggest. And he's, of course, writing history about his war. And he says, yeah, everybody has reverence for the past, even though maybe they shouldn't. Then he spends the first several chapters debunking the, the reverence for the past. So he seems to say, uh, and, and in terms of his war being a revelatory moment, um, the thing you become aware of when you read Thucydides is that he does so much shaping that you wonder, is this a revelatory moment or is this a revelatory observation? Uh, and so there's this uh, uh, elusiveness to it, but he does kind of on the one hand, he makes this very bold, in a way, philosophic claim about the value of his work, and at the same time, kind of puts up neon caution signs. Like, watch out, there's this, it's not going to recur exactly, and how exactly it recurs, and on what basis, 
is a question that he wants, wants us to ask. Um, there seems to be in both Aron and Strauss a concern about political history as opposed to, um, you know, for example, sociological, economic, or cultural history. Um, uh, Strauss talks about the move from political to cultural history, and, and Aron seems, a lot of Aron seems to be concerned about in, in this piece that he wrote, uh, Thucydides and the Historical Narrative. Um, he seemed to be concerned that historiography in his day doesn't really understand what can be learned from history and tends to sort of boil it down and, and ossify it in a particular way. So could you say a little bit about, I guess I should, should maybe back up, um, say a little bit about who Strauss and her own were, and they knew each other, maybe say a little bit about, about that. And then how does history and political history figure in their respective intellectual projects? Yeah, um, it's a, a good way to answer your question about why they're critical of other forms of histories to go back to who they are and why they in a way share similar project. Um, I, I suppose Leo Strauss does not need a lengthy introduction. He's quite well known as a historian of political thought, um, but also as someone who wanted to rehabilitate political philosophy through a, a form of historical inquiry that would destroy historicism and lead us back to um, a more genuine understanding of uh, a return to the Greeks, which is a return to Aristotle and Plato, but perhaps also a return to Thucydides and a way of understanding political life that has been forgotten or neglected. Um, but <clears throat> um, Aron, on his hand, is uh, born a similar generation as Strauss, so they're born around uh, uh, the same time. And um, they share, in a way, a similar project because Aron would also try to rehabilitate political philosophy understood in a certain way, but perhaps against different enemies, specifically French enemies that are different from Strauss's enemies, which are social science, historicism. Um, what is interesting is that they show a lot of similarities, um, theoretically, but also practically. They both lived in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. They both being Jewish had to face um, the rise of an, um, national socialism and had to leave Germany. So um, I think they're both very well aware of the reality of war, of the tragic character of the unfolding of events, of um, this um, perhaps more concrete nature of political life. It's not just theoretical knowledge, but there's something about it that's very concrete, which I think is one reason why they're both drawn to Thucydides. And so they met in the 1930s, um, in 1933 for the first time in Paris. Uh, then they met a few times after the war. They had a brief correspondence. Um, and their most direct point of divergence is uh, about Max Weber. They have very different views of Max Weber and they read it in completely different ways. But in a letter that Strauss writes to Ron uh, in 1963, um, he mentions the respect he has for Ron's work, but he also mentions that they disagree about historical consciousness and about the whole thing about historicism. And he, he says, I send you my book, The City and Man. You should read a chapter on Thucydides. You'll see why we disagree. And so Strauss himself points out to the fact that it's probably there that we can find what um, sets them apart. And um, But before we go to what sets them apart, what they share in common is this will to rehabilitate a form of rationalism, but also to rehabilitate the political. In French, we have the distinction between le politique and la politique. La politique is like, you know, day-to-day uh, -day politics, petty politics in a sense, and the political, le politique is this kind of notion of the political as this architectonic dimension of human life. And Iran, against a lot of the sociological tradition in France, um, which put the social at the forefront, which insisted on broader movements, wanted to reinsert back the political in a Thucydidean sense and insist upon that because he thought it was forgotten or neglected. Um, could you, I'm sorry, could you, could you explain for people what you mean by uh, uh, the architectonic sense of, of politics? I mean, so it's sort yeah. of a reference to Aristotle and so... Yeah, absolutely. There's something Aristotelian in uh, the way in which Iran understands this, that there's this idea that the political is not just about the question of the regime or of government, but that the defining feature of human association is the way in which we govern ourselves. And that is prior or has primacy over economic or social concerns. It what defines human existence more fully, that human flourishing is tied to the way in which we are living politically. So there's this element in, in, in Iran that's quite 
present and that might kind of bring him closer to Leo Strauss, who also had this similar view of insisting on the genuine true questions of political life, which is about the best regime and about the best way of life. So in that sense, they share a similar project and they both return to Thucydides, but then when it comes to it, they take very different lessons from it and they might read it quite differently. So that's where it gets interesting. Terrific, yeah. So, um, so at stake in, in political history versus say cultural or economic history is really what is it that defines the terms in which people understand themselves and uh, through which they can pursue flourishing. So for both Aron and Strauss, politics is really the most important thing. So, uh, so say, I, I'm sorry, say just a little bit more about who their enemies are and how political history, the recovery of political history um, plays into that. So historicism uh, is, is, I mean, define historicism and, and then uh, for, as Strauss understands it and, uh, and also how Aron, if Aron differs from Strauss in his assessment of historical consciousness, that, that implies a difference about the, the dangers or merits of historicism. And so if he differs, then how does his understanding of his opponents or his enemies differ? Um, I happen- so A little bit about historicism and then historicism, oh, yeah. Strauss and then- oh, well. I happen to have written a 700 page thesis, a dissertation on historicism, which I don't know why I inflicted them upon myself and it interests absolutely no one, but I'm glad that for one, I have someone asking me about historicism. So I'd be happy to talk more about it. And the truth is the more I learned about it, the less I know, I'm not sure what it is exactly, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, uh, for Strauss, historicism is at the same time an interpretive and a political problem. Uh, in interpretive terms, there's this thesis that if we are essentially historical beings and that any type of different historical context, epoch, uh, period is radically different from one another, then the criteria to judge might also radically differ and there's no possibility of comparison, which could lead to relativism. Uh, when you understand a thinker, we cannot judge or discriminate if what they're saying is right or wrong because it's just a thought that belongs to a specific context. So it prevents us as readers to fully understand the past because we cannot take thinkers seriously in their will or ability or pretension to say something tr true about the world because we can always reduce it to, it's an historical claim about a specific period. So there's this problem. But historicism also entails practical consequences for Strauss, which is that if we believe in the essential historicity of human beings, this means that our moral values and ethical um, yeah. beliefs are also um, radically historical and relative, uh, relative to a certain period. And therefore, uh, this means that if this is true, then there's no possibility for anything transhistorical or eternal or valid for all times. And he has a problem with that again, because it precludes from, um, thinking that we can in principle answer the most fundamental questions about um, political life. So his image is that of a cave beneath the cave. We're not even just in the realm of opinions, we're all in the realm of history that's below opinions and we're not even able to see uh, or understand or make intelligible the questions about the best regime because we only think those questions are historical and not true questions about political life. And so he has a very um, he's very strong critique of historicism. And what is interesting is that Iran uh, is very modern, very comfortable modern, has no problem with modernity. Um, and uh, in that sense, he shares the premises of German historicism. He believes that um, historicity is a, like a, a true thesis, that it's right, that it's valid, but for political reasons, that he thinks that we always think when we're confronted with events and that we need to understand the context in which we think as part of our um, way of understanding the world. So in that sense, they don't agree at all on the problems of historical consciousness. For uh, Aron, it, is, it doesn't seem like it is a problem. And um, what is interesting here is that it uh, has a lot of influence or a great impact on how they conceive of history and political history. 
And um, you said they're both big on political history or they're interested. The truth is Strauss is not very much interested in political history with the exception of Thucydides. And even then it's a few articles. Um, he prefers political philosophy. And on the other hand, uh, Aron perhaps thinks that those thinkers who are closer to history might have a better grasp of political life than philosophers. So here we see quite a divergence in their view of Thucydides because for Strauss, Thucydides is a good complement, but it, it's insufficient because it doesn't raise the question of the best regime. And Aron, for his view, uh, thinks that in fact, it is precisely because he's not a philosopher that he might understand political life better, but we can get to it. So they diverge on that, but where they do both agree is that um, the way in which Thucydides writes political history, um, he does something right that has been forgotten, uh, mostly um, in uh, cultural history for Strauss, which focuses on elements that neglect the political. And for Aron, it is in philosophy of history, such as Kant and Marx, but also in Durkheim and sociology, where um, the political, the actions, the individual actions are relegated to um, a second level concern. And so for both of them, Thucydides allows them to give back the nobility of those individual actions and perhaps a possibility to think about those in serious terms. Right, so for Strauss, he seems to, it sounds like he seems to want to recover political history because he wants to recover the possibility that from within politics, genuinely philosophic questions emerge, that there's the possibility of some assent that is denied by historicism. Um, and that's the philosophic problem. And then the, the political problem is if you dispense with the notion of the possibility of, of some higher ground on the basis of which you can come to a better understanding of just, justice than the particular movement in your society, then it doesn't allow you any recourse for negatively judging a move like the rise of national socialism in history, that you have to kind of go with the flow or maybe even embrace the flow because all there is is flow. Um, uh, and so it raises the possibility of a kind of romanticism, a kind of dangerous political romanticism of the sort that he witnessed in. Um, so there seems to be a, a desire to, yeah, not, Strauss isn't particularly interested in history, but he's interested in history to the extent that it allows for the possibility of uh, the center of philosophy. But Rowan, it sort of sounds like his critique, in a way, is of a certain insufficient historicism when it comes to the, the, the intellectual movements of his day, because uh, um, while Marx, uh, uh, and Durkheim seem to be historicists of a certain type, there are historicists of a certain type that still believe some kind of structural understanding is possible. So they're, they're sort of structuralist historians in the sense that history can be reduced to a kind of scheme. And for Rome, it seems like his critique is that that scheme, uh, whether it's economic history or cultural history, misses something that really is evanescent and historical, which is the situation of the individual actor. Is that sort of just a way of schematizing it? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely um, a good way. What is interesting in a way is that um, they both use um, Thucydides to advance a specific normative agenda, which differs and has to do with the way in which they envision political philosophy. And you're absolutely right that for Strauss, um, he mentions at some point that he wonders why Thucydides stopped on his ascent toward philosophy. That basically he's a philosophical historian. Why didn't he just do, do more? So there's something lacking in political history, which is you know, the true question of the best regime. In a way, Thucydides falls short of that. So there's kind of a negative judgment upon political history. And what is interesting, and we can discuss perhaps the specifics of Strauss's interpretation because it's a bit more complicated than that, because he recognizes what. Thucydides brings, especially with regard to relations between cities, because um, philosophy is preoccupied mostly with cities at rest, internal, the, the internal dimension of the regime, whereas the city sees something more that should be a complement to political philosophy or classical political philosophy. But for Aron, on the other hand, what is interesting is that 
he thinks that it is precisely because Thucydides remains in the particular that he's so great. There's nothing lacking in it. It's quite the opposite. And he's very clear that he would side with Thucydides rather than Plato any time, precisely because this freeing from those first principles allowed Thucydides to meditate directly on politics and, to, and for him to theorize or present or show us this dimension that Iran calls the antinomies of political life, those tensions that cannot be eradicated, either between daring and mod moderation, between war and peace, um, between necessity and contingency, uh, between intention and, and consequences. And he thinks that Thucydides displays all these elements, which should be the core of political philosophy. And in a way, it's a criticism of the Straussian view, because Iran thinks that um, if you come to politics through the intermediary of a system or great philosophies, then you miss perhaps part of the complexities and reality and ambiguity of political life. And so there's this dimension of particularity, which is almost historicist, that Aurore really likes and he doesn't want the cities to go into the universal because I think he, he thinks the value lies precisely there. Yeah, it's very interesting because uh, there's, there's a lot to discuss. Uh, uh, but one of the questions that immediately arises is to what extent is Aron not himself arguing for a certain kind of philosophic interpretation insofar as he thinks that there are some there is something transhistorical to be drawn from Thucydides. The, the historicism seems to be in tension with, with the, the claim that there's something lasting to, to learn, and or, which may be another way of asking it is what can be preserved about uh, um, the, the situation of the statesman. Um, and so you talk about these antinomies and, and at least at some point, I wanna, uh, I wanna get into those. What exactly is it that, uh, that our own things can be drawn and, and, and uh, um, that, that persists? Uh, so, um, but I guess more immediately, Aron has this very interesting discussion of, of Thucydides um, his access to politics. Uh, Thucydides was himself an actor, and uh, for uh, Aron, this is a crucial element of his ability to understand politics. Interestingly, it's Thucydides' engagement as a political actor that allows him to render something lasting beyond the situation. So he was a um, he was an Athenian general, and uh, he. Um, he couldn't quite make it to a town called Amphipolis and the, the Spartan general Brasidas got there first. And so the Athenian assembly being the Athenian assembly exiled him. And his response to that exile is very interesting because he says, oh yeah, now I have free time. Now I can devote more time to uh, writing my history. So he's an engaged political actor, but he's also an engaged inquirer. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and at this point, you say that uh, Thucydides was, um, well, I guess, say a little bit about uh, Aron's understanding of, of how Thucydides' engagement was important to his intellectual activity. And uh, then I want to, uh, um, in relation to that, you have this very interesting distinction between impartiality and neutrality. And so if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I eventually want to come back to um, your point about what Aron draws as a permanent features, because um, I, I'll try to show that his position in a way is more Straussian than he thinks, because he still has this element of transhistoricality or, or universality. But um, you're absolutely right to, to point out to this specific posture of Thucydides. And what is interesting in Aron is that he's not just interested in what Thucydides has to say, but he's interested in um, um, the posture of Thucydides as an actor, as a writer, and it's a constant preoccupation for Aron and other thinkers as well. He's interested in not just Thucydides, but Machiavelli, Tocqueville, and Clausewitz and Weber for the same reason, that they at the same time were at some point actors or engaged or closer to political life. And then, for example, Machiavelli was sent into exile and was able to have at the same time the proximity and distance. Same for Weber, who wanted to be elected, was not elected, but still gave him, you know, participated at Versailles in, in the negotiation. So Aron has this fascination with thinkers for whom participation in, in political life should have been the culmination point, but um, circumstances made it otherwise. So they had this um, 
very um, privileged heuristic position that would allow them to really fully understand actions while having this necessary distance. So um, uh, Aron makes a distinction between those thinkers who uh, start from philosophy and arrive at politics and those who meditate directly on politics. Haiti prefers the latter. And of course, there's something perhaps biographical about this that Aron himself always wanted to participate in political action, was a journalist for 30 years, was really engaged, but at the same time always remained on the margin, was a professor. So I think he's seeking in those figures of the past something similar. So there's that element. Uh, but what it allows Thucydides to do is um, that he's, of course, an Athenian, but doesn't have to seem to have a, a strong um, allegiance to the Athenians. He seems to have a preference for Sparta, which might be possible because of this distance. But also there's this notion of impartiality. And it's a distinction that um, both Strauss and Aron hints at, which is that um, in modern history, we imagine or we hope that the Australian would be neutral that there would be kind of a dissociation from any values, a form of disinterestment with the object. And what they like in Thucydides is that he's absolutely not neutral. He wants the good thing, he evaluates quite a lot. He makes evaluative judgments about characters, uh, you know, Nicias and his lost or how um, Pericles, how great he is. But at the same time, he is impartial. And being impartial means that you still want the best outcome, but that you're able to see different sides. So. Um, Aron, in particular, likes this plurality or pluralism in Thucydides because it allows for the reader to practice a political judgment. Thucydides does not tell us exactly what to think, but he offers us this diversity of perspective and forces us to actually um, make a judgment about the situation. And this, in a way, goes back to Hobbes's reading of Thucydides saying that he instructs us better than philosophy and better than any precept could do because he shows us reality. So in that sense, I think Aron is more um, convinced by that type of perspective that stands closer to political life. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because that by itself is still rooted in their overall understanding of the relationship between philosophy and history, right? Because for, for Strauss, and one of his criticism of Weber is precisely that the distinction between facts and values is incoherent, that if you really understand the facts, values emerge out of those necessarily. Um, uh, there's a way in which you can't, uh, uh, Ruth Lampert has this, this line in one of his books about Nietzsche that you can't, you, you know, ontology entails a, a, a kind of normativity to it. Once you understand the way things are, you're inevitably drawn into a certain posture towards it. But then with Aron, it seems to be from the flip side of that, that, that Thucydides' engagement allows, allows access to something that's unique in every circumstance. And yet in its uniqueness, there's something that persists, which is the confrontation with the contingent and the, the um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it because it seems like there's some things that, that aren't just contingent. They're something like permanent dilemmas. But uh, it's just occurring to me, for Strauss, there are fundamental problems that are philosophical problems. For Rome, there are, in a way, fundamental dilemmas, which is a sort of, there's always a structure, a kind of political structure to the kind of, of practical questions that statesmen have to, have to negotiate. But I mean, and the thing about Thucydides, though, is that he's, he's quite reticent. I mean, he doesn't really offer much in the way of, of value judgments. His intervention seems to be more in, in, uh, in terms of, kind of editing and arranging. And so he'll, you know, he's very sneaky in this way. So he'll show you the funeral oration and then bang, he hits you with the plague, which seems to completely explode the pretensions of the, of the funeral oration. Or he'll have the Melian dialogue and then he teases you with the, the theological response to the, the sort of the pious traditional moralistic response to the Melian dialogue and having the Athenians punished with the Sicilian expedition. But then things upon closer examinations start to look like, start to complicate. So he seems to, to um, like to arrange and edit so as to reveal ambiguity and difficulty. Um, and, and, and that seems to be a kind of pedagogy. Um, and so, so, you know, Strauss makes this claim that 
and, and this is foundational to his interpretation of Thucydides as a philosophic historian, but there's a way in which the Peloponnesian War, and this goes back to what I was saying about, is this a privileged moment or is it a privileged observer? Um, uh, the war is to Thucydides as Socrates' life is to Plato. And so in the same way that, that Plato as Socrates makes all sorts of speeches, and if you start examining the speeches, all kinds of problems emerge. Uh, the, the sitting speech doesn't quite seem to, to um, uh, pan out in the way that he, he wants us to think. Um, uh, and then for Thucydides, it's this very cagey arrangement of, of facts. So. Um, but, so I'll ask you, is that how Thucydides is philosophic? And secondly, if that's the case, that would then seem to suggest that his, his merits as a philosopher in a way depend on, on the, the acuity and in particular the psychological acuity of his observations as a political actor. Um. Thank you. I think you raised a question that goes even beyond Thucydides and has to do with um, the role of specific extreme or um, crises or unprecedented circumstances on thought and their role on thought. Because you can imagine in a lot of moments in history where you see crises and then you see the emergence of a lot of thinkers all at once, cluster of thinkers who arise, arise precisely because it seems as though the situation provokes this urgency, but also perhaps because it allows for individual thinkers who are already great to kind of emerge more. Of course, I'm thinking here about like the Weimar period where you see this explosion of thinkers, but also if you think about ancient Athens, which was the democracy was in crisis for quite a long time, and it might have led to the emergence of that. So I don't know if it's either the observer's privilege or the situation or, or just a meeting of both. And in that regard, there's a striking similarity, I guess, when you talked about this I'm with Aron, because Aron was thinking when confronted with the event. This is how he was functioning. This is what nourished his thought. So um, I suppose it's kind of, I don't know if it's 50-50, but you're absolutely right that the cities managed to capture something that might not have been immediately visible, but at the same time, without the war, he did not have the material for that to even happen. So it's a bit like um, when you have a sheet of music and that's great, but no one will ever hear it unless there's someone playing it. So I guess it's something similar with the cities. Um, so how is he philosophical? Is that because he's able to transform the material in such a way as to make it relevant or make it permanent, like um, uh, revealing the permanent uh, tensions or the permanent problems? Uh, or is he philosophical in other ways? Um, it seems as though even for Strauss, he's philosophical because of his reservation, not just because of his interventions, but precisely because he distinguishes between the speeches he um, ascribes to other and his own voice. And the double voice is what is interesting in Thucydides more than his transformation of the speeches, or so it seems. So it might be there that he's philosophical. And he's also philosophical because he manages to describe things in such a way that the par particular itself becomes universal. It doesn't have to leave it for it to become universal. So yeah, there you are probably right that it has to do with the talent of Thucydides as a philosophic um, uh, historian in that sense. So that, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a way in which uh, Thucydides, at least in the Strauss understanding, that Thucydides is able, because he's able to show how philosophic questions emerge from the particulars, um, the, the distinction between, this is, this is Strauss's critique of the distinction that, that comes from you know, our particular moment, the distinction we make between history and philosophy, but that Thucydides confounds that distinction because he shows how philosophical questions uh, emerge from, from the political. I mean, he has, he, there's this great line from uh, Thucydides, The Meaning of Political History, which is this essay that, that Strauss wrote, um, early one, in which he says that wisdom can't be conveyed, it can only be enacted. And so the way that the Thucydidean text does that is not by giving you judgments and principles and precepts, but by giving you sort of problem sets and you have to kind of work through the problems that emerge. And in doing that, you see how philosophic problems emerge from 
from, uh, from political problems, uh, not simply in Thucydides. In, in terms of dependence on the situation, I mean, so the beginning, for those of you who haven't read Thucydides, uh, the, the first 23 chapters, uh, little chapters, uh, are about the rise of Athens and Sparta out of um, dispersion and chaos. And it's sort of a state of nature account, um, but it's clear that it's meant to be a kind of developmental history of, of what, what Thucydides calls Greekness. Um, uh, and so it's, it's clear that in these different stages of development of political psychology, um, which as it happens just matches the three compulsions that the Athenian envoys to Sparta uh, uh, cite as uh, excusing and motivating the Athenian empire, right? fear, profit, and glory. You have fear, profit, and glory as stages in, in, the, uh, uh, in this section called the archeology span beginning. And so Thucydides seems to uh, argue that our, our ability to understand something fundamental and universal really is dependent on an historical situation, um, not, not because of the radical historicity of, of human being, but just it takes the phenomena to develop before you can see the phenomena and understand them. Um, but Iran's take seems to be uh, fundamentally different. Um, uh, so, well, let me ask you, you have a, a section on Strauss and a section on Aron, and uh, you give voice to an Aronian criticism of, of Strauss towards the end of the Strauss section, in which you say that Strauss neglects the, the political uh, in, in Thucydides. So explain a little bit what, what that critique is. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there are a lot of different ways, I suppose, to understand that, but it's it's mostly that Strauss's concern with political philosophy and the status of political philosophy might make him miss what is essential about Thucydides because he's so preoccupied with making him into a philosopher that it's unclear if he needs to be one. And um, one dimension is taking po politics seriously, not just because it might lead to fundamental philosophical questions, but because in the very details of it that might be even uh, banal, there might be something there. And um, at some point in his writings, I don't know where, Strauss talks about how, you know, politics is boring people talking about boring stuff. Uh, he's kind of joking, he's ironic, but there's part of it where Strauss was not that much interested in commenting on political events. Doesn't mean he wasn't interested in that, but he was still mostly interested in commenting on uh, you know, political philosophers of the past. And Aron seems to think that um, in a way those details are important. Those are political. They might not be immediately philosophical and that might be why they're important politically. And so there's this element of always wanting to reduce history history or reduce politics or bring it back to philosophy or as around things that we might not need to do that, that there may be something interesting in Thucydides that, ha that hasn't to do only with the ontology or the first principles. And so in that sense, I think Aron takes politics perhaps more seriously and what it has that it's um, perhaps less endearing or appealing. So there's this kind of element. And I, at some point you mentioned that Aron is concerned with those fundamental questions of political life and Aron with antinomies or tensions, which is a bit different. So the, the and um, in a text in the preface to, um, the translation of Weber's lectures, Aron addresses a lot of Strauss's points about Weber, but he says something interesting in his direct um, attack uh, to Strauss is that, well, we both agree that they're antinomies of political life. The question is about the role we make them play. And for Aron, they're irreducible. There's no point at which we go into the philosophical, there's something more. He stays closer to political life in that sense. He, and he refuses to assent. Um, and this is where kind of Strauss differs because he thinks we should go perhaps. And, and, and I'm not taking a stance in favor of Aron here because we could say, well, Aron falls short too because he's so afraid of the, ev of the events proving him wrong or not wanting to um, commit too much to philosophical positions that he refrains like Thucydides, Thucydides from doing so. And maybe there's something lacking in there too. So we couldn't, you know, 
articulate a Straussian critique of a row in that sense? Well, so this is great. So, uh, sorry, so many questions. Uh, uh, I've got a log jam of questions in my mind. Uh, wonderful. So I'll take this opportunity just to remind everybody, uh, uh, please give us your questions and uh, please put them in the Q&A section. Um, there's so much to talk about here. Uh, so, so please do so and, um, and please identify yourself also. So, uh, there's a way, so, um, there's something, there's an important convergence here because, you know, as a kind of uh, uh, advocate for a return to a platonic understanding, uh, I mean, Strauss has this line that um, uh, the very heart of things is in the surface of things, and um, in thoughts on Machiavelli, yeah, yeah. And on the one hand, he's talking about certain kinds of great books and, and how to read them, but on the other hand, he's also talking uh, talking about politics. And there's a way in which Aron is saying something sort of similar, insofar as for him, the the, the truth of politics is. Again, the, the, the political actor confronting contingent circumstance, and it reminds um, the crucible of decision. I think is is uh, I think that's maybe a line from Churchill, but um, it's it's this beautiful insight uh, that has to do with capturing um, this in a way fundamentally human situation that is. The confrontation with something that is always that is that is always changing. Um, but so, so, so what are the antinomies and what are the permanent lessons that that ought to be drawn from this? Because I mean, you you could I mean I think it would be unfair to criticize your own by saying, well, you're not saying very much. You're just saying things change, and you know, okay, we, we get through that sentence rather quickly. But but there's more to it than that, and some of it seems to be uh, an account of certain problems of international relations that are that are permanent uh, and the relationship between international relations and domestic politics which which are permanent and some of it has to do with uh again the the, the inevitability of decline um uh, but so speak a little bit about that what what's the what is that we're to learn from history yeah that that that's a good question and i guess it comes back to what i think is missing in strauss's account which is that you know i said he wasn't taking politics seriously i think iran wants to insist way more on the mechanism of political decision and political judgment from the perspective of the actor not just from a, a kind of general philosophical perspective but as it happens and there's this kind of um and I'm going to get to the antinomies this way, but there's this kind of great story about Iran being a young Normalian, you know, this, at the time they go to Normal Sud, this really great school in France, and um, he was just back from Germany, and he witnessed Hitler's speech, he witnessed the book burnings in Berlin, and so he had this acute sense of the situation, he had a good reading of the history as it was unfolding, and so he was called by the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs to kind of do an expose on the situation. And he did it brilliantly, you know, like they, they, they're doing it, Aron is good. Uh, but then the deputy minister was like, okay, but if you're you're in the minister's shoes, like what would you do? Like, it's all good, but it's a question of action. And Aron was really taken aback. And this is a start for him of never forgetting this very concrete dimension of there are people deciding at all times and they have to obey the servitudes of action. And he thinks that Strauss kind of neglects this aspect, the servitude of action, the part that has to do with contingency, with mistakes, with accidents. Um, and those antinomies he takes from both Thucydides, Machiavelli, and also from Weber, that for example, um, and he sees that quite clearly, and he's quite taken with this example from Alcibiades and Nicias, where they have this discussion about the expedition in Sicily, and things don't go not do not go as planned for Nicias. And he believes that he might convince them that it's uh, not prudent to go on, but despite his best effort, the opposite happens. The same way, you know, in many regards, Nicias is a good example of that, that he um, makes bad calculation, bad choices, waits too long because of the moon. Like it, there are all these elements that uh, come into play in the contingency of human action in the sense that what we intend and what happens are 
quite dissimilar. And he sees a lot of parallels with the way in which we can understand the actions of individuals and states in the 20th century. He thinks about the fact that, for example, Germany and France wanted to appease, um, uh, sorry, Britain and France wanted to appease Germany before the Second World War, but in doing so, they just let Germany uh, annex Austria, and eventually it led to the opposite of what they wanted. So for him, this kind of lesson from Thucydides is about this fragility of rationality in politics, and um, this is, I think, perhaps what Strauss does, he does see, but does not put at the core of political philosophy. Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to uh, drill down here because it's so interesting because certain aspects of this, like you read, um, you know, you read book six and seven in Thucydides and you see these mistakes that Nikias makes and you just think, you idiot, why are you doing this? The, the, the miscalculation and the discussion of the, uh, you know, whether or not to go Nicias loses that he doesn't want to go to Sicily. Alcibiades does. Uh, Alcibiades gets the Athenians uh, to be really interested in it, but and so they decide to go. And then Nicias basically throws it. Well, if we're going to go, then we need to go in massively, thinking that the costs will be too great. In doing that, he assumes that the Athenians are like him, which is to say, not wanting to make any risks. You know, excessively conservative. And so if the Athenians were like him, then they would do as he would do. But his problem is that precisely they are not like him. And so they think, well, now it's safe. Fabulous. Let's let's go. And so they he just arouses their their desire all the more. And so the mistakes all and you, you say this uh, uh, in your article is very nice that um, the mistakes are all intelligible as mistakes, which suggests that history is, is certainly intelligible, it's comprehensive. We can understand what they should have done. Uh, you know, Strauss points out that, that uh, Strauss points out that, that the Athenians could have succeeded in Sicily. But of course, the problem is they, they could have if human beings were rational, but human beings aren't, aren't rational. In a way, that's, that's the point. So how much of, of the how much of contingency is explained just by folly? How much of it is explained by pure randomness of fortune? And uh, is Arone's point that one can never really know what that mixture is going to be? You can't, you can't really gauge other human beings' rationality in, in their interpretation of events. Um, there's a, a passage that comes back all the time in Aurel's writing, and he takes it kind of from Marx, but transforms it completely. And it is human beings, or he says men, men make history, but they do not know the history they're making. And he doesn't want to mean by that that we're completely in the dark with regards, and that's that chance, you know, this idea that in, in politics, fortune ranks, he does not agree fully with that at all. Um, but there's still this idea that most actors, act as if they have full absolute knowledge while they only have limited knowledge, which is just um, a problem with the nature of reality itself. We cannot have full knowledge of a situation ever. And in politics, because there's this urgency to decide, you don't have the time the philosopher has to just sit back and read for about like five years and then figure things out. Right? There's this urgency that makes things, makes us much more prompt to mistakes. And what is interesting is that despite all of that, Aurora remains a bit of a Kantian in the sense that he believes there's an ideal of reason. He believes that people can be reasonable to a certain extent or rational. But of course, this is tempered by the fact that contingency uh, or folly or like the, the, and a lot of mistakes are done in, in good faith. They're not always just mistakes there. Um, and Aurora gives the example that you can design a policy or adopt a policy that might be good now, but disastrous 10 years from now. So it might be a good decision now. And that's, that's the historicist part that we need to be aware of the passage of time because things and circumstances might change. And that's the reality of politics that what is good here now might not be good later. And um, he finds in Thucydides this um, notion of time passing and the changes in circumstances. Um, and I suppose that he takes from that this question because Thucydides shows us a lot, quite a lot of mistakes that actors make. Um, and this raises the question, what if? You always ask, what if they did it differently? And for him, that's a good mechanism for any political actor to always ask about different probabilities of different scenarios. So this is kind of a lesson 
uh, from Thucydides, not about the content of history, but about the mechanisms of political uh, decision. Yeah, so much of what Thucydides has to teach is about, uh, you know, Diodotus uses the, the terms desire and hope, right? Eros and Elpis. And um, a lot of the history is about these fundamental sort of tidal psychological forces and the way that they, they skew people's understanding of themselves and of the policies and the, uh, that, that the policy options that, that are before them, the before them. To what extent does, well, I guess I should ask, does Aron think there is a human psychology, a trans-historical human psychology? And if so, is there anything about political psychology that he takes from Thucydides? Um, well, yes, this is where it gets interesting is that Aron remains a sources in the sense of he takes into account circumstances, historical circumstances, but he, he also in a way remains a bit Straussian in the sense that in the end, philosophy might reign supreme and to some extent. He's not ready to get rid of some idea of transhistorical or permanent political features. And so there's this idea that um, uh, there are those permanent lessons of political life that we can learn that go beyond periods or epochs. So in that regard, he might stand closer to um, the Straussian perspective more than we would imagine um, at first. I'm just wondering, should we also go into people's questions just because I want to make sure you have enough. Yeah, uh, 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 let's do that. Um, let's see. Okay, let's let's go into the Q&A. Um, I think Jeffrey has a question about um, Ramon Ron being an expert on foreign policy. Um, and it's absolutely accurate. This is how Ron was mostly known. Um, uh, he, he was a commentator of political events and he was closely following these events. And what is interesting about, of course, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and then a lot of other events in the 50s and 60s is that Iran was extremely good at prognoses, which is why it's interesting to study Iran, not just for his thought, but because he succeeded in political judgment, or so it seems. He was not often wrong about turns of events. And so you wonder, where did he that take that from? Is it from the cities, from other sources? But he has that talent of um, uh, accurately analyzing uh, political life, which perhaps is just something that came with uh, practical knowledge and not from any type of books. Um, Anita, should I read the questions or should I just answer? Uh, yeah, well, so, um, so Anita Sharma asks, who's the better reader of Thucydides in your view? Am I right in thinking that you think it's Aron? <laughs> um, well, I, I'm more of an Aronian than the Strauss. And to be full disclosure, I have a love-hate relationship with Strauss. I find him often right, but annoying. Uh, but here, here <laughs> what, is, what is interesting is that um, I think Strauss has a more accurate reading of of, of Thucydides mostly because he's more concerned with providing a very close uh, developed reading, whereas Iran uses Thucydides and um, as a leverage for something else, but is not proposing such a close reading. So in many regards, Strauss's reading is far superior if her criteria is this kind of internal close reading of different moments. But I prefer the overall portrait he has of Thucydides. And I feel, and again, we can debate this, I feel like Aron um, captures the posture and the intention of Thucydides better despite the fact that he does not discuss it as much. I don't think Thucydides wanted to be philosophic. I think Thucydides want, was concerned with political action. Okay. Uh, a student of mine, Peter Gobble, asks, uh, thank you for a great conversation on the antinomies of politics and the inevitability of decline. I wonder if this relates to the Thucydidean paradox between motion and rest in any way. The idea that human society begins in a stage of motion, but eventually becomes a cycle of motion and rest. And this is seen in the relationship between Athens and Sparta, war and peace, et cetera. Would either Aron or Strauss see the development of political history as moving within the cycle of, mo of motion and rest? And, and why would this matter? Yeah. Is this, I guess I'll add, is this one of the antinomies for, for Aron? It is. And what is interesting, it is also for Strauss. And I think Strauss thematizes this even more than Iran is on interpretation, contrasting um, uh, 
the city at rest and the movement of war as being this kind of greatest motion there is in politics and the fact that um, we always have this uh, interplay of the two and we cannot understand politics unless we understand this um, motion between rest and um, th this, this uh, antinomy between rest and motion. But I think Iran understands it a bit differently. Um, it's not just about war, but Iran thinks that um, periods of rest might be more transitory and that movement might be kind of the baseline. Uh, and he's in line in that with maybe a more Machiavellian reading of the cities in the sense that um, he thinks there's this kind of ontology of movement that most cities are always kind of um, never exactly at rest. Whereas I think Strauss believes that at least in Plato and Aristotle, you have these features of the city at rest. You have these moments where it's not exactly or always war. So I guess this would probably be an opposition between Strauss and uh, Iran, but that's a really good question. I don't know if you want to add something more aboard in here. Well, it's peculiar because Strauss's reading of Thucydides is that he's kind of a Heraclitian. And so for him, motion dominates, that he gives an account of motion rest. And, and you know, for him, Thucydides does have an account of the whole that, that, the, he under, that Thucydides understands the war as expressing the, these cosmic forces of, of motion rest, but that um, in a way, the interplay of motion and rest uh, uh, throws things in the direction of, of motion. And when he talks about the relationship between, and there's so much about his work on two cities that's, that's strange. Um, like in the city, of man, city and Man, it, you know, the essay on Aristotle in a way is about modern social science, and the essay on Thucydides in a way is about historicism or Heidegger. So it's it's hard to to pin him down. But it's you know, if he he casts, and I think for Strauss, there's more motion in Plato and Aristotle than than you know he puts forward, and maybe more rest in Thucydides. But the way that he he relates. You know, Plato and Thucydides, Thucydides is the necessary supplement in a way because of his understanding of, of the whole in terms of, of motion. Um, on this score, a, a great question by uh, my dear friend and colleague, Tom Merrill. Uh, the conversation has circled around the tension between universality and particularity or philosophy and politics, but it seems that Strauss and Aron shared a critique of one vision of the way philosophy can act in politics. The existentialism, uh, the existentialism of Sartre and de Beauvoir. Can Professor Marco Chenard talk about why these two thinkers both rejected that version of existentialism? I think this goes to the, you know, we were talking at the beginning of the political and philosophical challenges posed by historicism. Um, yeah, that's a really good um, question. I guess their enemies are a bit different. For Strauss, it's mostly Heidegger, and then for Iran, it is Sartre and Beauvoir, who, who have Heideggerian roots, at least for Sartre, but kind of transforms it into something perhaps more positive. But in that regard, what is, in, is interesting is that um, they both reject a view where um, you completely evacuate the role of reason. And this is basically where they meet, I think perhaps in the strongest sense is their defense of rationalism against these types of philosophy. For Strauss, it, you can see it very clearly, of course, in this chapter, Natural Right and History against Heidegger, but even in early texts where he defends this idea that um, ultimately there's this place for reason and existentialism completely leaves it out, especially in historic, um, in radical historicism as displayed by Heidegger. And then for Aron, um, it's on philosophical grounds and he proposes a very lengthy um, uh, analysis of uh, Sartre's philosophy, uh, which Sartre did not return the favor, Sartre did not read Aron at all, but Aron continued to engage with Sartre despite everything and rejected existentialism on similar grounds, which was a defense of rationalism, but also because existentialism in his view did not allow to reflect on politics fully because it started with claims that were moral in nature and were far removed from the reality of politics. And he thought that the result was that Sack was unable to actually be a good commentator on political events because his existentialism did not allow him to give him the necessary tools to understand politics. So they have similar enemies and I suppose they defend reason or rationalism, but it's also on um, perhaps different grounds uh, that they reject these uh, two uh, schools. And it's a very, very schematic view. So I apologize for all the shortcuts here. No, no, it's interesting. So, so in a way, so his claim is that there's something 
in a way moralistic about existentialism, that it has a moral agenda that prevents it from, from really being open to the phenomena of politics. Yeah, yeah, there's absolutely that dimension. And there's also this idea that, of course, like there's this radical freedom that um, uh, both Sartre and Beauvoir put forward. And you might see here some type of convergence with Aron because Aron talks also about the realm of contingency and all of this. But Aron does not believe that this freedom is absolutely groundless. He still believed that there's some type of ground here. He does not believe that reason is without reason, the same way Heidegger would say it. So in that sense, he is pushed back in Strauss's camp because both of them believe that ultimately it does not rely on nothing. There are things, and Iran is very clear, there are things on which people seem to agree uh, and there might be universal norms. So he's not ready to completely reject that uh, element, but he's a bit more prudent perhaps than Strauss in doing so. So could you, so this is, this is trivial, but uh, is it true the story that uh, in a national exam, something like Aron got first, but Sartre got second, or Sartre got first and Aron got second, and that was sort of the beginning of, of their, their mutual dislike? Uh, well, it's even worse because Aron arrived first and Sartre was what we call recalé, he felt and he had to retake it the next year. So it's not even as, it, and, and according to Aron, he felt on purpose because of course Sad was a genius even then. And no, they were still friends at that time. They called each other mon petit camarade. And basically the relationship was mostly Sartre testing new theories every week and Aron completely dismantling them and showing why they didn't work. And that was their relationship for quite a while. And uh, they eventually um, were divided by their stand on communism after the war. Uh, but, but no, until then they, they remained quite uh, uh, close. Um, and it's interesting that South decided to fail because he didn't care. And Aron saw him being first as a failure as well because it only meant that he was this really good scholar, right? Academic, but not a genius the way Sartre was. So he always had this kind of complex of inferiority with regard to Sartre, but that's kind of a side note. That's, that's interesting. So um, uh, uh, my dear friend and colleague Alan Vine asks, Thucydides brilliantly suggests that Athens could have prevailed if it acted reasonably, while at the same time, just as brilliantly showing why it was psychologically impossible for Athens to do so. Strauss and Rohn seem to agree with both diagnoses. I'd like you uh, both to be modern Thucydides and Straussians, Aronians, and diagnose our situation today. Oh, this is a trap, I should have known. Uh, uh, what is the reasonable course forward for the United States? And what are our national character faults that will undermine our long-term success? I hand that to you. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. And as I said with the students earlier, that being a good Aronian, I'm very prudent about judgments about the future because I know about the inner contingency and everything and the possibility of unforeseen uh, political experiences. The same way, uh, maybe on, as a side note, um, I was giving a talk at NYU on the eve of the election of Donald Trump in 2016. And I recall that a lot of people said it couldn't happen. And I said, well, I'm a good Aronian. I read Thucydides. This could very well happen. And of course, it did. And uh, I was right. And so there's this element about um, the possibility of contingency of unforeseen events, which means that uh, what is interesting about Iran is that, um, and I'm going to answer about the, the United States, is that Iran was not exactly pessimist, because if you have an open vision of history, this means that, of course, things can go wrong, but you can be surprised about how mistakes or other courses of events might make things right. And so um, I wouldn't be too... Um, quick to talk about the bleak portrait for the future. Um, but if we were to propose, I guess, a Thucydidean analysis of the United States, and people have done that comparing it to Athens, that um, it's um, hubris and desire for um, honor might lead to its demise. And I can say this because I'm not, I'm not American, so I have no stake in this. I'm Canadian and we just stay on the other side of the border and we watch the show, right? Um, I don't know if you have something to add, Borden. Uh, I, I have a lot to add, but I can't because I have to read other people's questions. So uh, my responsibility in the contingent moment is, is to make sure everybody else gets their questions asked, uh, maybe if, if there's time. Uh, so, uh, my dear friend Sarah Henry says, uh, in the end, if you think they differ at all, 
who has the better theoretical understanding of the relationship between nature and history? Strauss or Aron? Well, that's a very Straussian question, I suppose. <laughs> No, but it's a good question. And um, Aron is not that much preoccupied with the problem of the um, relationship between nature and history, which makes him a good historicist modern in the sense that um, uh, the moment where starting with Vico, there's this idea that um, we might be um, have a better understanding of history than nature because we're historical beings. Therefore, uh, it's even better because history becomes a content on its own and uh, nature is relegated to uh, a specific sphere and not the ground on which we think. And um, uh, so for Aron, he kind of accepts these modern premises without any problem. And I think in that regard, perhaps he's a bit oblivious to what is lost in that transformation or this change in the relationship between nature and history. And Strauss's uh, will, will to kind of reconnect with the possibility of asking the question of natural rights or asking the question of how nature was understood in uh, completely different terms. I think he does a better job because he seems more aware of the possibility of an ahistorical understanding of ahistorical thinkers. So in that regard, I would say um, it's definitely Strauss, but I would add that I think the one that understands it even better is Karl Lovett, who was one of Strauss's uh, good friends and also concerned with that. And I think his return to nature that's even pre-Socratic, which he accuses Strauss of remaining too historical, is even more convincing. Okay. Uh, uh, so I have a question from a, a student of mine, uh, Philip Eigen. Uh, if I understand correctly, Strauss critiques Thucydides' failure to pass from the human politics to philosophy, but as one cannot know the whole of history in the making, what would it have meant if Thucydides had extended into the philosophical? Is the value of his work that it relates directly to his experience and would the very nature of his conclusion change if he, if he were to, to continue on? Good question. Is, is there, does Thucydides provide a basis in the history of Pokemon's War for philosophizing beyond that basis? That's a good question. I think that was the question that Strauss himself asked when he asked in a lot of his texts, and he asks it repeatedly, what is the specific wisdom that issues in political history? What is that specific type of wisdom that doesn't seem entirely philosophical? It seems like a different type of wisdom than Plato. So in a way, he seems to be aware of the specificity of political history and the fact that it is irreducible to philosophy. So while he uses the language of assent for talking about history and philosophy, perhaps despite all that, Strauss recognizes the unique character and the fact that the Thucydides precisely holds meaning for us because he stopped on his ascent. So perhaps that would make him closer to the Aronian perspective because um, Strauss, of course, leaves the question open. He says it explicitly that we don't know what would have happened if the cities decided to uh, expand more and propose a philosophical or more philosophical reading. Um, but I suppose that's not even what the cities was aiming at. And it would have perhaps denatured his whole um, history in the sense that if he were to propose principles, then we um, are, are not left with what made it great for so many people, including Hobbes or Rousseau, which is that he makes us see political reality. And I think the relative invisibility of the cities in certain parts makes that possible, whereas the philosopher is speaking in his own name and being extremely visible. And I guess this is where there might be a difference. Yeah, yeah I mean, I suspect that the Straussian version of that would be that we have to presume that, and this is complicated because the text is incomplete, but that something like we would have to presume that the fundamental truth as Thucydides understood it was expressed in the text that he, that he gave us and that further philosophizing would just be a kind of a repetition for that. I mean, there's something, you know, there is a, a kinship between Thucydides and philosophy and, and Plato when it comes to the, the paradoxical character of, of what it is we're supposed to learn. And there's a way in which the, the ultimate truth is something that, that can only be expressed uh, uh, in, in terms of a dilemma. I mean, I'm thinking about the question of, uh, and this is, you know, Strauss is so 
again, he's he's cagey about this question of whether Thucydides. He says that Thucydides doesn't talk about the best regime, and he doesn't talk about the best regime, but he indicates the best regime is lifetime, and he gives us these these two poles, Thucydides, uh, uh, Athens, and Sparta, and the the best regime is in a way split between them. Right, I mean, uh, uh, Sparta is the best regime in the sense of being the most moderate. So it seems to be the embodiment of the, the politically most important virtue, which is moderation. Not justice, by the way, just moderation. And, and, and so therefore stability. Um, but Athens is the best regime when it comes to fostering individual, individual excellence. So, and this, you know, everybody reads Thucydides, you know, the, nobody wants to be a Spartan. Uh, but Sparta wins, and it wins because it avoids the the internal stasis that that the, the internal civil strife that that Athens can't avoid. So the best has this uh, again this paradoxical character for Thucydides. Um, but I would just add on that, like you mentioned that Thucydides has this reflection on the best regime, but it's it's mostly best relative to something. It's best for moderation or it's best for that, right. but he doesn't right. raise the question of the best regime simply, which is Plato's question. And I guess this is where it remains too tied to the context or the events or the regimes themselves. Uh, Thucydides doesn't seem to think that the best regime w would be achievable. Well, I mean, I don't think the best regime is achievable for Plato either, but I think I think the question is, uh, the question is, does Thucydides not speculate about the best regime uh, because he's simply rooted in the context, or is it because he thinks that, in a way, it's an unintelligible question phrased in that way, that, that there, it could be that there's something simply bifurcated in human nature that, that does not allow of... of framing the question in that way. All you can do is, is articulate the human problem in terms of these two poles. Um, this, this is this is a Ross interpretation, which is against Strauss. It's precisely that. And uh, to me, to me, it makes more sense. Well, except it sounds like for Rowan, it's that um, it's that Thucydides is rooted in the historical circumstance, right? And there's, it's the question is, is it just the historical, is it contingent or is it because the fundamental truth, the fundamental philosophic truth is a, a paradox. And I sort of think, I, I, you know, again, mm -hmm. I think Strauss is cagey about that, but but you think that's- in, in Strauss, your has, Strauss has a zetetic position about this. He's not, he's not exactly um, answering either. And, but, I, but I'm just gonna say this because I thought about that. The fact that, um, you know, is it just historical circumstances? And I thought about the fact that for Strauss, not all historical situations are equal, that maybe some historical situations might make us, might reveal things better. And maybe this is what happens with the cities. So I thought that was kind of interesting, this anti-historicist reading of history. Um, should we go on with the questions? I know we have a little time left. Yeah, so uh, uh, Sarah Hauser asks, what do you think is the primary value of reading Thucydides for students today? Do you see him in any way fundamentally different from the way that Strauss and Aron do? Oh, I think we skipped some questions, but sure. Um, We've got, oh yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, Ali uh, Ayasi, Carleton University. Uh, my question is, thinking back to your comments on thinkers who are ostracized from the political realm, Thucydides and Machiavelli in particular, and the lessons they teach about political speakers, such as Nicias and Al Alcibiades. Uh, taking their, their teachings into consideration, why would it not be better for those who want to be politically effective to pursue and learn rhetoric from history instead of political history, history of politics or political philosophy? And then Burke, for example, rather than Machiavelli. It's a great question. Yeah, the question of rhetoric. And, and the truth is, uh, for a long time, of course, rhetoric was seen, you know, as it was taught by Aristotle, by Cicero, or by many, as the true way to an art of, of governing, and as not just being this negative. Uh, element that would be about persuasion and deceiving, but also about um, uh, the best way to um, uh, debate and deliberate. So I guess this is a really good question. For a long time, it has been a school of politics, right, rhetoric. Um, so it's interesting. I guess it's a different question, but it's one that maybe we should ask again. Should, should we not learn more about rhetoric to be good, you know, 
political um, actor. So I guess, Ali, I just agree with your question. That's another added dimension. And we could perhaps say that uh, we learn indirectly that from Thucydides and his speeches, because if you study them, you study the interplay of, of reasons, the way in which people try to persuade, the appeal to certain sentiments. Of course, Pericles' speech is a great example of that. So I guess it, it is rhetoric in action if we uh, see it this way. Truthful. So Sarah Hauser asks. I, I think I think we skipped Merrill just prior to that. Oh, he he's he told me he wants us to to. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, uh, let's see. What do you think is the primary value of reading uh, Thucydides for students today? Do you see him in any way fundamentally different from the way that Strauss and Rome do? So what's your view? Uh, uh, enough with with Strauss and, and Rome. What do you think about? It's the interesting thing? because I encountered Thucydides before I encountered Rome and Strauss's interpretation, and perhaps in a very naive way, as a you know student when I was in undergrad. There's something absolutely gripping with the cities. And in my view, and then perhaps this is why I'm an Aronian, I felt for the first time that was not as abstract or difficult to grasp as Plato and Aristotle, that in a way I felt like I understood he made me see politics, he made me see these problems and these tensions, and they felt a bit more alive. So there's this dimension of classical political history that in a very naive way makes you um, reflect on politics, perhaps in a very more direct fashion. I don't know what was your experience with the cities, but when I teach it to students in second year, it is by far what they prefer. It seems in a way to speak to them more directly. So there's the question of what in his narrative creates that um, sense of uh, eradicating the historical distance. Yeah, I found that to be the, the case as well. Uh, um, the great thing about teaching at AU is that uh, American University students are very politically engaged. And so at first they think, ah, ancient history, and then they're, they really fall in love with it. And uh, I mean, I teach them more in a, in a Straussian kind of way, but the, the value of that is then they see, okay, these, these philosophical questions are not remote and you know armchair, they're, they're really, he, he brings these dilemmas home in a very vivid way. Um, so uh, let's see, David Brostov. Hi, my name is David Brostov and I'm a sophomore in the Lincoln Scholars Program here at uh, uh, American University. Okay, good judgment on your part, David. Uh, how does Aron use Thucydides' history to analyze international relations in peace and war? And how does his concept, his conception of international relations differ from Morgenthau's? Ah, great. That's a really good question. I'm afraid I'll disappoint David, so I apologize in advance, David. Um, but, um, well, first, um, his reading of Thucydides, um, I think, comes a bit after he writes Peace and Wild. Of course, he knew of Thucydides' work, but it became more important perhaps a bit later on. But that being said, there are definitely features, um, especially in the way he understands the dynamics between different states and the way he describes it. There's something very to CDD in about it, about um, the way he um, explains this political psychology, perhaps of different states. And he mentions in his memoir that he wrote that book and he wrote his book on uh, US foreign policy in a Thucydidean spirit. So also with regard perhaps in this case, it, uh, not using Thucydidean categories, but a Thucydidean method methodology in the sense that he wanted to uh, describe you know, carefully and truthfully the way in which things were, but he was also passing evaluative judgment. So this kind of mix of uh, accurate, you know, factual description with evaluative judgment, he also takes from this idea of political classical history. Now, how it differs from Morgenthau, uh, I'll have to say that I don't want to risk uh, making a mistake here, mostly because uh, I don't know if you can see behind me, but like two rows are just Iran books that are not about international relations. And uh, a very honest answer is that he, um, wrote so much that I'm not as familiar with uh, his international thought and the way to relate to Morgenthau. So perhaps if someone else wants to jump in, I'd be happy to uh, answer. Or Well, well I mean, I, I don't know Arone, uh, but you know, sort of standard rap on, on Morgenthau and, and the realist school that follows from him is uh, an excessive confidence in the role of reason in international affairs. And um, you know, this is why it's sort of lampooned as the billiard ball school of, of international relations. And certainly for Thucydides, um, folly plays an important role. Um, the way that, that human beings 
misinterpret the cosmos because they want it to be a certain way and it's not the way they want it to, to be. And so uh, there's a kind of uh, train wreck of competing and uh, conflicting follies that uh, give rise to, to international events and, and well-meaning follies and sometimes even uh, just half follies. Um, the Athenians get a lot right in their sort of scaldingly cynical understanding of international relations, but uh, they also lead themselves astray because of it. They aren't as clever as they, they think they are. So, I mean, I guess I'd put that out there as a principal difference between Thucydidean realism and, and say, Morgan Fowler realism. But I'm not an expert in this area either, so. Well, well, thank you for all these good questions. This was a really productive ex exchange and thanks to you too, Borden, because it was really enlightening to share these insights with you. This is so much fun. This is this is really marvelous. I, I have one question that I'll that I'll ask, uh, as sort of on, in as a follow up. So, and, and I was kind of leaning this direction when I asked you what our own draws from Thucydides in terms of political psychology. The maybe the, the the biggest difference between the way we understand politics and the the world that Thucydides shows us is the, the love of glory. So love of glory is a principal motive um, in, the, in the history, especially with uh, Periclean Athens, but not just Periclean Athens. And it's very interesting because it suggests that there's something about politics which seeks something beyond politics, some kind of, uh, there's a kind of fantasy of transcendence that's lurking in, in politics, which is, just, uh, it's just not in the liberal framework at all. And so uh, typically when I teach Thucydides, there's, there's a certain amount of resistance. Like if you look around the international scene, really, do you see anybody who's, who's seeking glory? And I think you do, but we have to interpret it in a different way. So we'll see Putin or, or Xi or, or various leaders uh, seeking to, to um, seeing something like glory, but we see it as uh, a kind of domestic con job for the sake of internal uh, stability or, or um, power or something. We kind of deflect the question of, of glory uh, in, into other categories. And so I guess I want to ask, what do you think about love of glory in Aron's understanding of politics? And is, is this something that, what do you think about that generally on the international scene? That's a really good question. Um, um, Aron, Aron is aware of like this, the presence and insistence of, of this theme in Thucydides. And I think he believes that to a certain extent and under different forms, it still plays a central role. This idea of, of wanting to project a certain perception or identity on the international scene has to do with it. Um, uh, even wanting to have the moral high ground as a democracy. And of course, he, he speaks in the context of a tension between the Soviet Union and the United States as superpowers. So for him, this kind of search for glory, for example, in uh, who will be first to go to the moon and all these elements for him point towards these uh, the construction of these representations that have to do with glory and have to do with these um, perhaps symbolic representations as well. So it does not perhaps take the same um, uh, form as wanting to gain immortality for specific conducts, but still has, you know, wanting to be written in books as being the first to do something or as being the leading figure in something. And that to me seems to have to do something with glory even today. Yeah, something about the desire to be remembered um, uh, and escape, you know, escape time somehow. Um, Okay, so I've gotten the okay. Uh, Tom wants me to read his, his second question. Another thinker that both Strauss and Aron interpret is Machiavelli. How do you think their different interpretations of Machiavelli reflect their different understandings of the world? 
That's a really good question. I spent a certain number of years being a, a fan of Machiavelli and reading everything I can. Um, uh, what is disappointing here, and I'll have to say, is that uh, Aron's reading of Machiavelli is more about the reading of Machiavellianism in the 20th century. So the uses and the ways in which Machiavelli is portrayed in a certain light. Uh, so he publishes during the war Machiavellism in the 20th century, but he never proposes um, a very um, close reading of Machiavelli the way Strauss does. Um, again, um, there's kind of a similar problem here, a similar tension between Strauss and Aron, which is that Aron um, likes Machiavelli because he's a spectator and actor in history, and his perspective allows him to grasp the same way, this ontology of movement, this role of Fortuna, uh, whereas for Strauss, it's way more complicated. And then uh, Aron completely issues or neglects the question of the role of Machiavelli in the modern problem. So he does not deal at all with Machiavelli being this instigator of a rupture between the ancient world and the moderns. So in that sense, um, I suppose that Strauss makes Machiavelli play a more central role. And what would be interesting here is um, if we really want to do a fair comparison is to go between Strauss and one of her own students who dedicated his life to Machiavelli, uh, Claude Lefort. And he wrote a book, Le Travail de Love Machiavel. Uh, he was a student of Aron for 15 years. I don't recommend anyone do their PhD for 15 years. This is a bad idea. But <laughs> Lefort had a great book that came out of it, Machiavelli in the Making in English. And in that book, which is kind of an Aronian book uh, in some ways, he spends about 100 pages criticizing Strauss's interpretation. And he is to be more of a worthy adversary if you want to compare two different readings of Machiavelli and his role in modernity. So that might be perhaps a more uh, fair, um, you know, debate or uh, between two uh, interlocutors. Well, uh, we're just about out of time. Um, I, was this actually, so one minor question, who are the chief Aronians today writing? Are there Aronians that, that are in the, the intellectual circles in France? That's, that's an interesting question because, um, again, um, when you compare, because this is what we're doing now, compare Strauss and Aron, there's something like a Strauss in school, but Aron never wanted to found a specific school, school or even to, to have something. So, so the Aronians are very dispersed and they do very different things. You had Pierre Asner in international relations who died uh, a few years ago and was a great uh, pillar in international thought in France. You have Pierre Manon in political philosophy. Uh, Marcel Gauchet, in some ways, Claude Lefort, uh, Pierre Rosanvalon, who's a um, kind of the leading uh, figure in political philosophy right now in France. So a lot of these thinkers were all students in a seminar, in a real seminar, and they all take small different things from him, but it's not a coherent whole of principles pre precisely because Aron was not a dogmatic thinker in any way who proposed a series of principle to adopt. Uh, so people are kind of inspired by a certain attitude or way of researching more than by the content uh, of his thought, but that, that's a good question. Yeah, well, uh, at, at Chicago, um, I mean, Hosner and, and Menal were both friends of Bloom's, and so they were sort of, they're around and would, would come through. And, and so, and I think Bloom was a friend of Aron's as well. So there was uh, sort of a sense of, of, of that crowd. Um, but there was something very uh, romantic about it, sort of the, the you know, these uh, uh, real politique uh, French crowd. Uh, uh, Professor Marco Chenard, thank you so much. This was fabulous. This was a marvelous conversation. I learned so much from this conversation and from your piece. Thank you uh, for coming and talk to, talking to us. So. Thank you so much to everyone, and thank you for engaging with me in such a lively matter. I appreciate it quite a lot. And um, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And of course, thanks to Alan for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much.